Very good. So, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today is our pleasure to host Dr. Nabil Wassini, who will speak about Saudinizing criminology, uh, Saudinizing Arab criminology. Uh, Carla will briefly introduce our speaker and then we're going to go. Yes. Nabil Wassini is an assistant professor at Prairie View A&M University. He received his PhD in criminal justice from Indiana University at Bloomington, and his research include mainly comparative criminal justice and criminology, criminal justice reform, legitimation and legitimacy, and crime criminal justice in the Arab world. Uh, so that's it, uh, Dr. Nabil Wassini, uh, over to you. Right. Well, first, thank you for the invitation and warm welcome. Um, it is an honor and pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, I also like to take the opportunity to congratulate you guys on this effort of southernizing criminology and regions that have um, kind of been neglected. Um, I think this accomplished uh, this is a huge accomplishment and a um, a much needed um, contribution to the discipline. So what I want to do today was talk about Arab criminology and start off by talking about. How I got interested in this particular topic. Um, in 2011, um, I was a graduate student at uh, Indiana University, and the events of the Arab Spring were momentous for, uh, at that time period. This is a time period in the Arab world where there was protests, um, revolutions, um, in the aftermath of those protests, you had seven different regimes that were turned over, that were overturned, overruled, and new governments were formed in these different countries. And at that time period, uh, being a, a student of Arab descent in the United States, I wanted to look into uh, you know, the criminological aspect and look at criminology in the Arab world and see what was written at that time period. Uh, There's a lot of work that was being published in political science uh, and economics, um, sociology, anthropology, looking at the Arab world. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in our discipline in criminology, there weren't there wasn't much that was written about it. Uh, since the time period, uh, you know that this this the, these events occurred. Um, if you look at the, the different disciplines that I mentioned, they looked at the conditions before the Arab Spring. They looked at the conditions during the Arab Spring, and they also looked at the conditions after the Arab Spring um, to see, you know, from their particular disciplines what happened in, 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 the, in the events of the Arab Spring. Unfortunately, when it came to criminology, there wasn't much that was written about this particular topic. And this was, I, I believe, a very big missed opportunity from criminologists. Um, just like we see here now, you know, with COVID, all these criminological uh, journals, you're seeing that there's these COVID-related uh, journals looking at uh, policing through a COVID perspective, looking at corrections through a COVID perspective, looking at juvenile justice through a COVID perspective. During this time period, you saw a lot of the political science journals looking at the Arab Spring from their perspective, but nothing was um, examined from a criminological perspective when it came to the Arab Spring. Now, the reason why I believe that's a, a hugely missed opportunity was because criminology was at the center of the protests. The criminal justice systems in that, in that part of the world were at the center of a lot of the grievances that people had in that region. So if we look at the pictures that I have here, um, Mohammed Bouazizi, the very first picture there, uh, he was a spark. Um, he was kind of the spark that started the Arab Spring. He was a young man who was, um, you know, constantly, uh, you know, being bullied and pushed around by police officers. He was a fruit vendor. Um, and he, as a form of protest for all the, 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 you know, the bad experiences that he had with police, he committed an act of self-immolation. So he burned himself alive as a form of protest. And this was a spark of the Arab Spring. Um, and all of this was because of the way that the police treated him as a person of a quote unquote lower class. Uh, the next picture there is Khalid Saeed. He was the reason why there were protests in Egypt. He was a young man who was um, keeping surveillance of corrupt police officers. And when the police officers uh, in, in Alexandria in Egypt uh, caught up with him, they beat him to death and then accused him of being a drug dealer, right? Um, and his story went, you know, spread through social media and it really angered the Egyptian pop population. So when the Arab Spring came about, he became kind of a rallying cry for the Egyptian people. Another very tragic story is of this young 13-year-old boy, uh, Hamza Ali al-Khatib. Uh, he was a young boy, 13 years old. 
He wrote some anti-Assad um, in Syria, anti-Assad graffiti on the wall. And when he did that, police captured him, tortured him to death, and had him killed. Um, and he was also another reason why there were protests in Syria. So there's a lot of these different uh, personalities. Hats Hatserbil is a human rights advocate, a lawyer in Libya. He was also the reason why people were protesting in Libya. Uh, Tawakul Karman uh, won, won a Nobel Peace Prize. She's a, the, the, the lady that you see at the, at the end of the slide there. Uh, won a Nobel Prize for her um, push towards democ the, the democratizing uh, Yemen. And she had to constantly deal with police and, and her efforts as well. So what I'm saying here is that with each one of these stories, the criminal justice criminology is at the center, as at the heart of every one of these issues, yet it has been completely neglected um, by criminologists. So what we want to do is that we want to set out and explore, um, develop, and establish uh, what we call a subdiscipline of Arab criminology. So what I want to do is before I can move forward to talk about Arab criminology, I have to talk about what the Arab identity is. Um, so the Arab world is uh, a part of the a region of the world where you have about 400 million citizens. Um, it spreads from North Africa all the way to West Asia. And there's about 22 different nation states that, that belong to this region. And one of the things that I want to point out is that the region is not monolithic. Uh, it's very diverse when it comes to the different races that live there, the different ethnicities that live there, <coughs> excuse me, different languages and different cultures. So how do we bring about a, a whole region of, of, of different races, uh, cult, you know, cultures and ethnicities into one uh, kind of regional name? Well, what we did was that we used what most academics, what most politicians use as far as how they define what Arab uh, identity is. Um, the, the, the definition comes from the Arab League. And the Arab League is, is, a, is a league of countries that brought about all the Arab countries into one uh, group of, of countries. And this came out of what they call Arab nationalism. So uh, around the, the, you know, the time of World War I and World War II, um, the Arab world was uh, under European colonization. And what they wanted to do was kind of uh, follow in the footsteps of European nationalism, uh, follow the steps of Turkish nationalism. This is after the kind of the fall of the Ottoman Empire and also follows Jewish nationalism um, and the, uh, you know, the, the founding and establishment of the state of Israel. So the definition that we use according to the Arab League is an Arab is a person whose language is Arabic, who lives in an Arabic speaking country, and who is in sympathy with the aspirations of the Arabic speaking people. Now, when you look at that definition, it's pretty broad, uh, but the definition is broad and is intentionally broad. It's written in this way so that it can be an inclusive definition of who is and who is non Arab, especially when we talk about a very diverse group of people that live in this region. Um, so the Arab world shares similar language, ethnicity, history, customs, and political aspirations. This is something that anthropologists kind of share as well. And the reason why we use this particular definition of what an Arab is, is because these are the parameters um, that are used by uh, academics, politicians, and policymakers uh, when it comes to politics and um, academia. So again, the reason why we, do, uh, we use this definition is because it's the most widely used uh, conceptualization of what an Arab is. So um, in defining Arab criminology, um, we also provide just, just justifications for the establishment of the subdiscipline, uh, And we base this on four different components. So we're, we're arguing for an Arab criminology using four different components. And that is Islamic law, um, Arab and ethnicity, uh, a collective history, culture, and language. Um, and I'm gonna go into the next slide will be Arab, the, the Arab diaspora, as well as transnational crime. So uh, mainstream Northern criminology, uh, we believe is ill-equipped um, to examine a legal tradition. Now remember that there's different legal traditions, right? Um, you've, here in, in, in the UK, you have the common legal tradition. So a lot of the countries that were um, colonized by England have that common legal tradition. Um, then you have the civil legal tradition. Well, a big part of the world is also following the Islamic legal tradition. Um, and we feel that a lot of the Northern perspectives or people that have been uh, educated from the Northern perspective don't really have a good um, foundation in understanding the Islamic legal tradition. Knowing that has influenced a third of the world's legal systems um, in Muslim countries, the Islamic religion is a powerful force guiding the thinking, behavior, conduct, and reaction to criminological issues. So unlike the global North, um, what we argue is that uh, religious institutions are strong, 
um, in regimes across, especially the Arab world. And religious institutions play multifaceted roles when it comes to governance. So Islamic law in a lot of the Arab world still continues to shape cultural, legal, and political definitions of crime and punishment in the Arab world. And this is why we say that this is a major component in understanding or why there should be an Arab criminology because this is a major component that also needs to be studied. When we're looking at Arab ethnicity, a collective history, culture, and language, um, the reason, another reason why we argue for an Arab criminology is because uh, people in the Arab world have a traditional lineage. Um, they also have a mutual history. And when I talk about a mutual history, um, <clears throat> I'm focused mainly on, and I think that this is something that Arab criminology can also contribute to um, some of the ideas that are out there in terms of historical criminology. Um, you know, generally when we tend to teach about uh, theories and the history of crime and criminology, we talk about, you know, the classical school, the positive school, and we kind of build from there. Um, when a lot of these ideas that exist within the classical school or the positive schools were actually debated and discussed um, throughout medieval Islamic history. So if you look at the works of uh, people like Ibn Khaldun, uh, Ibn Rushd, or Avasaurus, uh, Averosis, I think that's his Greek name. Um, these, these individuals from medieval Islam have long discussed and have long written about uh, different theories of criminology that have not been uh, discussed in mainstream uh, Northern criminology. Uh, another, so, the, so the mutual history is there, also shared experiences. The Arab world has shared experiences and this, you know, this is from the expansion of Islam into the Arab world, um, you know, coming from the Arabian Peninsula and spreading to West Asia and North Africa, um, from the Crusades, you can talk about the Mongol invasions, uh, the Ottoman Empire basically ruled most of the Arab world, as well as the shared experience of European colonization. And recently, and what I mean rec recently, you know, in the 60s and 70s, the move towards decolonization in the Arab world, it was a shared kind of experience um, in terms of um, trying to getting uh, rid of, of a lot of the European powers that were ruling different parts of the Arab world. So these are some of the commonalities that we're arguing here for why there should be an, an Arab criminology. Along with that, transnational movements that have a lot of influence in the Arab world, uh, as well as pan-Arab modern culture. Um, you know, part of the reason why uh, the Arab Spring spread so fast in the Arab world was because everybody in the Arab world was sharing, um, you know, social media. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Tunisia or in Syria or in Iraq or, or Yemen, you know, everybody has access to those particular things. And people were communicating throughout different countries using um, that social platform. And obviously a, a similar language as well. So this is the second component that we're talking about here. Sorry, let me just uh, take a sip, sorry. Um, the third uh, component that we argue for is the Arab diaspora. Uh, a subdiscipline of Arab criminology would also provide insight in, into the millions of Arab, Arab uh, sorry, Arab diasporic communities that live across the world. Uh, there's a lot of large amount of minorities, uh, Arab, Arabs uh, as minorities that live in countries like Chad, Iran, Israel, and Turkey. There's a lot of post-colonial migrants to Western Europe um, from the Arab world uh, in France, uh, particularly from North Africa and, and, and so forth. Uh, in North and South America, there's about a million um, Arab Americans that live in the United States. Brazil um, has about 16 million Arabs that live in, in Brazil. Um, and a lot of the Central and, and, and South American countries have had have big Arab communities and have had past presidents that were of Arab descent. These include Argentina, Brazil, uh, El Salvador's pre current president is of Arab descent, Colombia, Ecuador, um, and Honduras. So this is uh, another aspect that component that we're arguing for here. Um, the third one is transnational, transnational crime. Um, the Arab world has become the center for the world's major issues regarding global security. And deficient knowledge can often lead to inadequate security policies that waste resources, undermine economies, and further instability. Uh, there's a lot of different transnational crimes that have been specific to the Arab world and have been plaguing uh, that part of the world um, that we believe an Arab uh, criminology can address. This includes, uh, includes human trafficking and smuggling, uh, drug trafficking, arms uh, trafficking as well. And the problem with this is that because there's a lack of research on these particular issues, um, we are unaware of the full extent of, of these particular uh, transnational crimes. 
But I think the main one that needs to be addressed, and this is something that um, a lot of people focus on, is terrorism. Uh, terrorism is, is a, has been, in the past two or three decades, a huge um, issue in the Arab world. Um, but one of the things that we argue for when we talk about an Arab uh, southernized criminological approach is that it needs a nuanced approach um, to local criminal justice uh, context. Uh, you know, looking at the terrorism literature, for example, we found that one study examines 300 different academic texts on terrorism, to, uh, uh, on terrorism on the Arab world. And basically what they concluded was that the region, um, they found that the region to be highly politicized, intellectually contestable, and damaging to community relations and practically counterproductive uh, when it comes to research on that part of the world. So this is why we argue for a Southern approach when it comes to uh, transnational crime in the Arab world as well. I wanted to kind of give you guys one example of this, and this is something that, um, that we've been working on. Uh, so three of the most world's most uh, wanted terrorists in the past 20 years, um, it's an interesting case when we talk about these individuals. Uh, Ayman Zawari is currently the leader of Al-Qaeda. Uh, Abu Musab Zarqawi was the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, this is during the, the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, and Abu Bakr Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. Um, all these individuals were products of uh, pr the prison system in the Arab world. Uh, Zawahri was uh, radicalized and became an extremist when he did time, after he did time in an Egyptian prison. Same thing with Abu Musab Zarqawi. He became radicalized and became an extremist when he did time in a Jordanian prison. And oddly enough, uh, Baghdadi uh, became an extremist when he did time in Iraqi prison, which um, ironically was uh, actually ran by the US uh, military. But when we talk about counterterrorism, this is an example that I wanted to give. There's different approaches that we can use um, when dealing with these particular uh, terrorism issues. So the, the traditional approach to, to counterterrorism has been retribution, right? Um, the use of punishment to go after terrorists. But just from, if we take a Southern uh, Arab chronological approach to understanding terrorism, we can see how different Arab countries have reacted to terrorism in different ways. So Algeria, for example, when they had a civil war in the 1990s, they used amnesties, right? The idea of an amnesia, an amnesty, a complete forgiveness of, of uh, you know, past crimes uh, to bring about peace in that society. And the amnesties actually did work. And it was an issue where, uh, you know, you had a civil war in Algeria, over 150,000 uh, citizens were killed during the war between Islamic extremists as well as um, members of the military, and they both were conducting, uh, you know, atrocities uh, against the civilian population. And one way that they were able to deal with this particular situation was to provide an amnesty. And there's problems with it, but that's something for a different discussion. In Yemen, um, one of the things that they kind of did to deal with extremists was have public television debates between Islamic scholars and these ideologues that belong to extremist groups, right? Another alternative approach to dealing with counterterrorism. In Saudi Arabia, they have what they call terrorism rehab centers, right? So the idea of, and, and of course, there are conditions to it, right? So if a person has committed an act, a violent act against someone in society or any act of violence, uh, they were not uh, eligible to be part of these um, rehab centers. But for anybody who was radicalized and who did not commit a violent act, uh, was, uh, you know, able to join these rehabilitation uh, centers, right? There's some controversy with them, but um, it's something that the Saudis have used and it's worked well for them according to the studies that have been out there on that particular uh, rehab centers. The media, Iraq, um, there's a very popular show. They've used reality TV in dealing with terrorism. And what they did to kind of um, keep people from committing acts of terrorism was that they've had individuals who committed acts of terrorism who have been arrested and have been found guilty go on camera explain exactly what they've done in terms of the process of committing the act of terrorism and then at the end of the show they have them uh, talk to uh, victims and victims family members so that so that you can see the the the, the impact that they had in the violent acts that they committed against um, individuals in Iraqi society. So they had they actually had a reality TV show dealing with um, terrorists and terrorism. Um, and lastly, you know, another alternative is what Morocco has used. Um, they've actually recruited and um, you know basically use female imams or female uh, Islamic scholars 
to convince, to kind of educate uh, women and also children to kind of keep the, the next generation from being radicalized within a lot of these groups. And the reason why I mentioned this is just providing different alternatives um, to one specific uh, crime. And here we're talking about terrorism. So when we talk about southernizing uh, Arab criminology, our agenda in southernizing Arab criminology is to resist uh, northern hegemony and biases and expose its limits through southern perspectives that foster new global projects and narrow the current gaps that exist between the north and the south. So we want to use um, the southernization of Arab criminology as an approach to countering ethnocentrism and the perceived universality of northern perspective as uh, perspectives as the only successful approach. And we see Southern criminology as an opportunity for both the North and South to communicate and exchange knowledge rather than completely dismiss, criticize, or discredit Northern contributions of criminology. There are schools of thoughts that, that basically argue that um, we need to completely uh, dismiss and they kind of question this idea of Southern, uh, uh, of southernizing criminology. And we don't take that approach. We believe that there are things that we can use for Northern uh, contributions to criminology. And we would encourage Northern criminologists to um, you know, be involved and also take part in understanding crime in the Arab world, along with working with those from the, from the Arab Global South. So in, um, in Southernizing Arab Criminology, we want to pay uh, special attention to two criticisms of Northern approaches. And this, we're going to talk about two uh, approaches that we believe uh, you know, justify, um, justify the Southernization of Arab Criminology. And the first one is Orientalism, and the second one is of Islamophobia. Now, we believe that exists within Northern um, approaches of criminology. So Orientalism, uh, these views of the Arab world date back to European imperialism and provide the same justifications for past and current policies of interventionism that characterizes the region as inferior or the violent, uncivilized other. Uh, these perspectives uh, depict Islam, Islamic law, Muslims and Arabs with demeaning, exaggerated and prejudicial stereotypes that rationalize Northern foreign policies within a larger Orientalist political uh, framework. So um, when we talk about Orientalism, we're, we're focused on the work of Edward Said. Um, he, he was a person that wrote the book Orientalism. And we argue that Orientalism still continues with a lot of the Northern approaches. And there's different reasons for this. One, um, we believe that there's a lack of challenging a lot of the Northern approaches, especially when it comes to um, criminology in the Arab world. The lack of voices that come from the Arab, from Arab scholarship. And, there's, and the reason for that, we can, you know, there's different reasons for that. But a lot of it has to do with um, scholars that come from the Arab world that don't speak, um, you know, the, the, the academic languages, the English and the French and so forth, right? So there's not that contribution from these particular scholars. Um, and also the lack of benefits um, that come from a non-Western approach. Most people that work on criminology in the United States or in the UK and, and other northern uh, parts of the world focus on their own country, right? Um, in the United States, you know, where I got my PhD, it was all US focused, right? And I'm sure here in the UK, it's, it's, it's primarily UK focused. So um, there's not a lot of focus on non-Western uh, countries and non-Western um, uh, approaches to understanding um, the global South. And there's always been this uh, from Orientalism, this, this perceived um, Arab justice being, uh, you know, uh, quoting from a particular text here, uh, severed hands, religious police, and Hadi justice, meaning that it's uh, justice based on the whim of, of a particular judge. So, um, so we believe that empirical research and sociological reflexivity would confront these oriental uh, archetypes imposed on the study of crime and criminal justice in the Middle East and North African region. Sorry. The second point here is Islamophobia, and this has been a big issue. Um, a lot of this has escalated after the attacks on 9-11. Uh, for example, in the United States, we've had several states 
ban um, Islamic law or Sharia law, um, despite the lack of defining what Islamic law is or uh, the lack of any issues with the Muslim communities that exist in these particular uh, states. So the Islamophobia industry has now become a multi-million dollar industry um, and rep misrepresenting Arab culture and Islam to the public and what has now became known as a green scare. Um, there's a lot of literature on this. If you, if you uh, look up the, the green scare and how uh, the growth of the uh, Islamophobic industry has played a role into foreign policy foreign policies in the United States and, and, and in Western countries. The media has become an integral reason for the persistent, inaccurate, and harmful depictions of Islam and Muslims in the media. Uh, and this is the studies, a few studies just on this. Media exposure to these negative portrayals increases stereotypes to the point that participants in numerous studies on Islamophobia believe Muslims are always behind terrorist attacks, should have their civil rights restricted, and support military action against countries located in the Arab and Muslim world. And this is something I believe that became quite clear, especially with um, the current war in Ukraine and Russia. And you can see the difference between how uh, that particular conflict has been uh, covered versus how conflict in Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, a lot of parts in the Arab and Muslim world have been covered, where you know there's this uh, you know, perception that War is natural in the Arab world. It's something that is you know, expected, where it's not really expected in other parts of the world. Um, and as I said before, this is very beneficial for the military industrial complex. Um, and is this kind of overall belief that um, war is the norm in Arab and Islamic societies, but, but not others. So let me go ahead and go to the next slide here. So the reason why you mentioned this, when we talk about southernizing Arab criminology, we have to, you know, we, we, we make a point that you have to be uh, cognizant, you have to be aware of Orientalism and Islamophobia that exists within Northern approaches to Arab criminology. And the problem that this has caused for Northern criminology is produce an inaccurate analysis of the way criminal justice institutions are organized and function in the Arab world. This uh, Orientalism and Islamophobia has also uh, undermined Northern criminology with claims about crime and violence being a natural byproduct of Arab societies. And also you've had a lot of experts and there's books and books of this. And I see this all the time, especially in the United States where you have quote unquote experts publish books and articles without objectivity, uh, without any training in the Arab language nor any immersion or understanding of the region. And this is something that you see all the time, um, you know, in, in a lot of the bookstores um, that I've seen in the United States. Uh, the results replicate Orientalist visions and characterizations of Arab societies as being violent, irrational, and monolithic. So the challenges, there's a lot of challenges when it comes to doing, um, studying criminology in the Arab world. Um, especially when we're talking about authoritarian, uh, autocratic, uh, monarchical regimes um, that form the vast majority of the contemporary Arab states. And I wanted to bring to your attention the case of uh, Giulio Regeni. Um, this is a very famous case that, that, that of, a, of a young uh, graduate student that was doing research on trade unions um, in Egypt. Um, he was found, uh, he was at Cambridge University. He was abducted and violently tortured to death for his research on independent trade unions. And what eventually happened was that when this got international attention, um, the Egyptian government within a few days or weeks uh, blamed it on five individuals who they had, uh, you know, basically on a, on a raid had killed and blamed um, for uh, the death of um, uh, the young student that was uh, doing his, his dissertation research in, in Egypt. Um, obviously, um, the international community and the Italian government was very skeptical of this, but this is a reminder of some of the uh, issues that, that, you know, that can pertain. And he was, you know, he was studying independent trade unions, but you can imagine that if you're critical of, um, you know, criminal, the criminal justice system or criminal justice institutions, um, it's a very politically sensitive topic and it's very dangerous um, to conduct such research um, in this part of the world. So academic journalists, civil society organizations, and activists were perceived by, were, are, are perceived by these regimes to be actively shaming and insulting their governments, 
especially when they expose human rights violations. This is something that you come across when you do research in that part of the world. Um, if Even if you are from that part of the world, but you're, you're educated from a Western institution, a lot of people will see you as, well, here we go again, here's that Western educated person uh, here to tell us how things should be done, how things should be ran, right? Or trying to expose us as being, you know, inferior to the, you know, um, to other countries. So this is an attitude that you find a lot when you're doing this type of research in that part of the world. Um, and Arab criminology, like other disciplines that study the region, must contend with the lack of academic freedom and demanding research conditions. The opportunities and topics of re criminological research will vary by individual regimes with each national context demarcating matters that are off limits and others that are tolerated. The reason I put, I put this in here is that not every Arab country is the same. Every, you know, every Arab country is going to have certain things that are going to be taboo that you don't, can't touch, you can't talk about, and other things that are open that can openly criticize. So again, it all depends on context, on what you plan on researching and what you're planning on looking at, and that's going to determine what you can and cannot talk about when doing this type of research. So moving forward, when it comes to moving forward um, in uh, southernizing Arab criminology or Arab criminology in general, unfortunately, when we talk about research on Arab criminology, the research is conducted unsystematically, um, is scattered through numerous disciplines. So you might find an article, excellent research done by an anthropologist, but they're looking at it from an anthropological perspective. You might find another one done really well when it comes to crime and families done by a sociologist, right? So it's really scattered through a, a variety of different disciplines. Um, and there's also a lot of NGO reports. So they're very helpful when looking at different issues within the Arab world, but there are many, many gaps that exist when it comes to research in this part of, uh, part of the world. There are no criminological conferences, academic societies, or journals when it comes to uh, research of criminology in the Arab world. Um, this is surprising because in almost every region in the world, there is some form of, uh, you know, association, right? So there's a Caribbean, uh, you know, a criminological association. There's Asian criminology. There's African criminology. And odd enough, uh, oddly enough, you know, a lot of the African criminology doesn't cover too much. It focuses mainly on su uh, sub-Saharan Africa, not too much on North Africa. Same thing with Asian criminology. If you go through Asian criminology, it's focused mainly on East Asia, on the Indian subcontinent, but you rarely see anything about uh, West Asia or looking at Syria or, you know, the Gulf countries or anything else like that. So even though there's Asian criminal criminology and there's African criminology, is largely neglected um, the Arab world when it comes to these different uh, uh, parts of the continents. So that's part of the reason why um, we're arguing for an Arab criminology as well. So what we're trying to do is attempt to develop an agenda that fills the current gaps of research that exists within um, Arab criminology. And we're open to interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary research um, when it comes to you know, uh, understanding crime and criminology in the Arab world. And along with the current contribution, uh, a hyper-specialized criminological approach is urgently required to address the deficient amount of work in and from the Arab world. As I said at the beginning, very beginning of the talk, the, Air, the Arab Spring was a momentous event that occurred uh, in the Arab world, and it was completely missed. And, and as I said before, uh, criminology was at the center of the protest, but I didn't see, you know, as a graduate student, I was still working on my stuff, my dissertation, all that stuff, but I did not see any uh, major contributions from crim criminologists when it came to uh, the Arab Spring or any type of work um, about the Arab world. So I'll conclude it there and then uh, we'll open up for discussion with everyone. Thank you very much, Andrew, for your presentation. Um, it is fantastic uh, that you have managed to give us such a broad overview from uh, 